morning, Bridge family. How are we feeling this morning? Awesome. 11 o'clock. Uh, if you have your Bible, open up to Revelation chapter 3. That's where we're going to be this morning. Revelation 3. Some of you said, ooh, yep, it's going to be fun. Um, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Jared Carter. I'm the other Jared on staff. I oversee community and discipleship here at the bridge. And if you're a guest this morning, we just want to say welcome. We're thankful that you would choose to spend your Sunday morning here with us. And so we are in the last week of our series called Seven Deadly Sins of Suburbia. Have you guys been enjoying it? Oh, man. Okay. That's awesome. Sounds like it. Uh, each week, what we've been doing is we've kind of been tackling one of the seven deadly sins as well as uh, the opposite of that sin, which would be a virtue. And what we've been talking about is not just sin, but what happens when the gospel begins to take root in our hearts, what are things that are cultivated? And so each week we've kind of been looking at a sin as well as a virtue. And so what we've covered already is we've talked about pride and humility, greed and charity, anger and patience. We've talked about envy and love, gluttony and self-control. And then last week we talked about lust and purity. And so the, today we're going to be looking at one that you probably won't even care about, apathy. Mm -hmm, yeah, some of you don't get it. That's right. Uh, historically, here's the deal. Historically, this sin is referred to as sloth. And, uh, and so maybe sloth or laziness. But when you begin to do a little bit of digging, what you find out is that it's actually translated and, and closely associated with um, laziness and apathy and indifference and carelessness, which is really, really fascinating. Because if you think about it, as we talk about this today, I don't think um, the biggest threat to Christianity is people who are anti-God. I think the biggest threat to Christianity today is a bunch of Christians who maybe become a little bit apathetic in their walk with Jesus. And so we're going to see that today. And so apathy is probably the word that resonates the most with us, but you can also, uh, you can totally see how laziness fits in there. So we'll talk about that a little bit today. But if you break down the word apathy, you get um, apathos, which means without emotion or feeling. And so just for the sake of our conversation today, here's kind of how we're defining apathy. Apathy it is a lack of feeling or concern towards someone or something, all right? It's a lack of feeling or concern towards someone or something. And it seems as though apathy is growing rapidly in our culture. Would you agree? Point proven. Okay. <laughs> 11 o'clock. You can do better, I promise. What's fascinating to me is this, that companies will spend millions and millions of dollars on uh, marketing efforts just to do this. They want to invoke emotion, and they want you and I to care about the products that they sell or the services they provide. In fact, um, if you watched the Super Bowl last weekend, for a 30-second spot during the Super Bowl for a commercial, anyone want to guess how much it cost? $7 million for 30 seconds. And the question is this, why would companies spend that kind of money on 30 seconds? And here's why, because they know that if they can convince you and I that what they sell will actually add value to or it will bring satisfaction to our lives, then in the end, they're actually going to benefit, right? That $7 million means nothing to them because they know if they can just captivate your emotions and your feelings. And so that's why some of the commercials are really funny. That's why some of them are a little bit more serious. But feelings and emotions are powerful, Right? If you think about it, you probably spend the majority of your day, the decisions you make are based on your emotions or your feelings. All right? Now, sometimes that's an okay thing, and sometimes it's not a good thing. Right? Sometimes you're like, you need to remember the facts over the feelings. But by default, here's what I was thinking as I was kind of thinking about apathy. Naturally, you and I typically care about things that will benefit us in one way or another. Right? If you think about it, the things you enjoy, it maybe it invokes some sort of emotion or you care about it because you benefit from it in some form or fashion. And so what we do is we live in a world that I would say is saturated by media. And so you and I are always hearing of, of all these things. And I don't know about you, but it is overwhelming sometimes um, about the amount of things that we should care about. Can anyone else relate to that? Like you hear all the things that we should care about and it's just kind of overwhelming. And so if you're honest, here's what quickly happens. We can kind of become fatigued. We can kind of become emotionally numb. And we can also kind of fall into what I would call self-preservation mode. Here's what this looks like. If you're wondering, do I have apathy in my life? Here's some things that we typically will do. Uh, we will just check out emotionally, right? Someone will be talking and we act like we're listening, but we're really just not even listening. Or um, we'll make excuses, 
or maybe perhaps we're, we'll pre- procrastinate on things, or maybe we'll spend hours and hours on this device just to numb out because it's easier to numb out than it is to care. And so if you and I are not careful, here's the, the concern is that apathy can easily begin making its way into every aspect of our lives. And the way it's revealed is in laziness. It's revealed in carelessness. It's it's revealed in indifference. It's revealed in like, oh, I just, I don't really care. I don't have time to care about any of those things. And if we're not careful, that mentality begins to make its way into our spiritual life as well. And we become apathetic in our walk towards Jesus. And so apathy is dangerous because... What apathy is, is it's choosing the easy at the expense of action. All right? You and I as believers, if you are a believer in the stream, you are called to action, to live differently in this world. And so apathy is dangerous because it's literally choosing the easy way at the expense of action. And so here's the scary thing. Here's what some of us will do. I was trying to think, why is apathy so hard to diagnose in our lives? What we'll do is we'll actually become really, really busy with a lot of stuff. And we'll use busyness as an excuse to not care about things that we should care about. Right? I'm just too busy. I just don't have time for it. But what we're going to see today is this, that if you're a follower of Jesus, you and I are called to a life of compassion and a life of diligence. And so we're going to unpack that a little bit this morning. But we're going to be in Revelation 3, which is actually going to speak directly to apathy and complacency. So some of you, you hear Revelation, you're like, let's go. This is going to be a fun morning. I'm just going to give you a a warning on the front end. Are you ready? Um, This one stings a little bit more than you might anticipate. As we talk about apathy and we see it addressed in Revelation 3, this one stings. And so let me pray for us because I do feel like this morning is heavy. I don't have a ton of fun illustrations for you guys. We're just going to walk through the text together. We're going to make some observations and hopefully make some points of application for ourselves. All right? So let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning. I thank you for just any time we get to gather as a body of believers and look at your word. God, I thank you that every, um, every T and every I is important in the text. I thank you that um, we don't have to come here and, and hear opinions, but we get to look at your word and see what it does. God, I pray that your spirit would do what only it can do, that it would convict us where perhaps we need to be convicted this morning. I pray that you'd give our minds and our hearts the ability to focus just for a few minutes and begin asking questions of how does this apply to me? God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As always, before we jump into the text, I always um, feel like it's important to give you guys some context because what we're looking at is, is pretty important. And so this book of Revelation, it is literally a revelation that God gave to the apostle John. Uh, who wrote this concerning prophecies about end times and what's going to happen uh, at the culmination of history. And so included in Revelation, uh, at the very beginning of it, you'll see that there are seven letters written to seven different churches uh, that existed during that time. And in, in the beginning of each letter, there's typically words of praise, like, hey, good job, you're doing great, good for you, like you guys are, you guys are awesome, uh, except for the church that we're going to look at today. The church we're looking at today is a place called Laodicea. Some people, can't call, some people call it Laodicea. It's fun either way, however you say it. Laodicea, there was a church in this city. And what we're going to see is that they didn't get the praise on the front end. In fact, what they got was an, a very harsh rebuke. And the reason we're looking at this text is because it does talk about apathy and complacency. And you're going to see it here in a moment. So there's a couple things that you need to know about this city. Uh, I don't want to be super nerdy on you guys, but I think there's some some things you have to understand because it's important as we begin reading the text, there's some language that is used. And if we understand the context, it's going to make a lot more sense. All right. Are you with me? If you are, say, uh-huh. Good. All right. First of all, you need to know that this city, Laodicea, was known for its wealth. It was an extremely wealthy city. In fact, in AD 60, there was an earthquake that happened that kind of destroyed the infrastructure of the city. And so things were in shambles, and so they, they went to go rebuild it, and typically um, they would receive imperial help from Rome. Like Rome would typically come in and kind of help rebuild things. And, but the, what they said is they said, hey, Rome, we don't want your help. We're going to rebuild everything by ourselves. Like, no thank you. And so they did just that. It would be the equivalent of maybe like a major city in the, in the United States. Maybe a natural disaster comes and just destroys all kinds of things. It would be the equivalent of that city going to... 
uh, the government and saying, hey, no thanks, we don't want your help. No thanks, FEMA, like we're good. We're gonna build this all back by ourselves on our dime. And so as you can imagine, they did that. They rebuilt this thing. And so there was a lot of pride for their city. Like they loved the place they lived. They were extremely wealthy. They were wealthy for two reasons. Typically, uh, actually not typically, two reasons why they were, were wealthy is because of the production of this fine, glossy black wool. And so they, just this fine linen that they actually would export out of there all over the world. And so it was, their exporting business was going amazing. But they were also known for their school of medicine. Their school of medicine, particularly, they had developed this special eye ointment that you would use and you would, you would rub it on your eyes. And it was, a, um, it was a cure for the common eye troubles in the Middle East. And so they had developed this. So they had the school of medicine. They had this eye ointment they were known for. And so in many, many ways, this city was like, man, this city has it all together. They're doing great. The downside of the city is this, that they had a horrible water supply. All right, just like Central Texas, terrible water. All right, they had bad water and it was insufficient to provide for the growing population. So this city was booming. It was known for its wealth. It was the place where everyone wanted to be, yet they had this water supply issue. So what they did is they built these aqueducts and they would bring water in from nearby cities. And so you, some of you might already be thinking, you're like, I don't even care about this, all right? Some of you need to understand, like, the reason I'm telling you this is because these things are going to help us understand the language that Jesus is going to use when he's rebuking the church in Laodicea. And so you're going to see it here in just a minute. But here's why they get this harsh rebuke, because the church had become apathetic towards Jesus and towards the life that he had called them to. And we're going to see that. So there's several reasons why their apathy was cultivated and developed. So there's three reasons we're going to look at this morning, three reasons why people typically become complacent and they develop apathy in their walk with Jesus. And then on the back end, what we're gonna do is we're gonna spend a few minutes unpacking what it looks like to live a life of compassion and a life of diligence, all right? Does this sound like a plan? All right. Some of you don't care, it's fine. Uh, verse 14, here we go. It says, write to the angel of the church in Laodicea, uh, that's a little bit weird of a word, uh, right to the angel. It just basically translates as messenger, right to the messenger of the church in Laodicea. It says, thus says the uh, amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. Verse 15, I know your works, the, you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Welcome to the Bridge Fellowship. We're glad you guys are here. Here's the first thing we see in the text. The first thing we see is that typically apathy is cultivated when we forget our purpose. If we forget why we exist, we forget our purpose for, for doing the things we do, that's when apathy begins to set in. And these verses sometimes are very, very commonly um, mistaught, misunderstood because the historical context isn't taken into consideration. And so if you remember, Laodicea, they had this serious water problem. So as I said, they built these water ducts, aqueducts, to bring water into the city. Two cities nearby, one of them was known for their hot springs. One of them was known for their cold springs. And so it was really, really interesting uh, because what would happen is these, this water would have to travel about five or six miles through the aqueducts. And by the time it would arrive into the city, oftentimes it was undrinkable and it was lukewarm, right? And, and so... If you notice in verse 15, here's what Jesus says. He says, I know your works. In other words, hey, I'm not fooled by, I, like I know your heart, I know your intentions. And like Jesus knows what they're doing. And then he says, I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. A lot of times when you've heard this, maybe you've heard this passage taught, sometimes we think that hot means good and cold is bad, right? If you've ever traveled and you've taken a cold shower, cold showers are not great. Like hot is better, like warm water is, is helpful. And so if you notice, watch what he says. Hot is not good and, and cold is not bad because watch what he says. I wish that you were cold or hot. He's like, I wish you were cold or hot. And the reason he's saying that is because cold water and hot water were both considered valuable. They were both considered useful, right? There was a usefulness uh, to this water. And, and if you think about it, most of us, we take water kind of for granted because we, um, we have easy access to it here in the United States. We just do. But hot and cold water 
had tremendous value in those days, and it also has tremendous value today. Like, if you think about it, um, if you want to relax, what do you do? You sit in a hot tub, right? Hot water. If you have a sore throat, what do you typically drink? You drink hot tea, right? Or you go to Starbucks and you order yourself a medicine ball. And if you don't know what that is, go next time you get sick and you'll thank me later. But you get a hot medicine ball. You drink hot water. If you live in Texas in the month of August, then you know that a glass of cold water is extremely valuable, right? Like it is so valuable. And so Jesus tells them this. He says, look, you're neither cold or hot. He says, you're lukewarm. And so essentially what Jesus is saying right here is this. You guys have become absolutely useless. Like, as a church, you've forgotten your purpose, and, and you're just like that lukewarm water that's piped into the city, and it's completely undrinkable. Raise your hand really quick if you like to drink lukewarm coffee. Anybody love lukewarm coffee? Oh, my goodness. That's all right. A couple of you guys, Jared Patrick like, likes lukewarm coffee as well, and I told him, man, that is sinful. You need to repent, and it's gross, all right? Like, you do not need to drink lukewarm coffee but he's saying, look, you're just like that lukewarm, co lukewarm coffee, that lukewarm coffee, uh, the lukewarm water that's piped into the city. It's gross. It's undrinkable. It's, it's not useful anymore. Because the church had forgotten their purpose, they were so content, and we're going to see it in a minute, they were so content with their material wealth, with their accomplishments, with, with their extracurricular activities, they were so focused on themselves um, that they had forgotten their purpose. And so Jesus says, that he will vomit them out of his mouth. Very vivid illustration, but it's important for you and I to note this, that Jesus is not talking about them losing their salvation. Right? Sometimes this is taught as, but that's, that would be completely unbiblical. Anytime you look at the text, you can't just draw a conclusion like that. You have to ask, what is true throughout Scripture? Because Scripture does not contradict itself. And so when you look at it, uh, it would be completely unbiblical to think that this is Jesus talking about salvation. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. He's not. Because what we know in Ephesians 2 is that salvation is by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. And it's a free gift from God. Right? There's nothing you can do to earn it. And so um, what Jesus was doing was he was using a very vivid illustration to show them, hey, I'm disgusted by your apathy, your uselessness, your laziness, the way you're just kind of going through life and you've forgotten who you are and what you're called to. This would have been a very powerful rebuke. And I think here's some of the application for you and I. I think it's repulsive to Christ whenever believers live this status quo lives. We're just going with the flow. We just kind of blend in with the culture and we forget our purpose. When you read through the Bible, what you will know, what you will, becomes very clear is that the purpose to life is this, to know and make known the God of the universe who changes lives through Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to. In uh, 2 Corinthians 5, the Apostle Paul is writing 2 Corinthians and he says um, that we are Christ ambassadors. That the way we live our lives, the way we treat our, our friends, the way we treat our spouses, the way we raise our kids, like we are supposed to live life as if God were making his appeal through us, which is huge, right? Matthew 22, Jesus is talking about the greatest commandment. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So you have love God, love people, Right? Live as though God is making his appeal through you. Church, this is what we're called to. Love God, love people, and we have the greatest news ever to take to people. And so the question is this, how are we doing at that? How are we doing at remembering our purpose? Um, there are times when we make Christianity all about ourselves, don't we? What I mean by that is sometimes you and I are very prone to think that God wants to make us happy. And it's not that God doesn't want to make you happy. What he cares more about is that you're holy, that you're set apart, that you're different, that you don't look like everybody else. In fact, this whole theme goes all the way back through the Old Testament. If you read, you see God and the nation of Israel, and he says, I'll be your God, you'll be my people. I want you to be holy and set apart. That word holy means, it means set apart. He's like, I want you to live differently so that when other nations look at you, Israel, they will say, man, the God of Israel is the one true God. Don't do things like the rest of the nations, like live differently. Like you don't need a king, I'll be your king, right? Israel gets hard-headed, they're like, well, we want a king. But God's like, no, 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 be holy, be set apart, be different, live differently. And the same thing is true for you and I, we're to live differently. God cares more about you becoming holy than he does about you being happy. 
But here's what we also do. We buy into this lie that church becomes just this place we attend on Sundays. And if you don't like the guy who's preaching, that's fine. If you don't like the worship guy, that's fine. Just get in your car, drive to another church, make sure that church checks all your boxes and makes you feel good, and just go to church there. That's what you can do. But what we have to remember is this, that the church is a movement of people with this incredible story of redemption for all people. I'll say that again. The church is this, it's a movement of people with an incredible story of redemption for all people. That's what the purpose of the church is. Church, we can't not forget that. We're to live lives differently and love people like crazy because we have this incredible story of redemption to share with them. Does that make sense? You guys good? Okay, let's pick it up in verse 17. For you say, I'm rich. I have become wealthy and I need and need nothing. Quick question, who is the emphasis on right here? Me, right? Like you say, I have, I've, I'm rich, I've become wealthy, I don't need anything. He says, and don't you realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked? Then he says in verse 18, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by the fire so that you may be rich. Pay attention real quick. Remember I told you what they were known for. Watch the language he uses. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. White clothes so that you may be dressed in your shameful nakedness not exposed. An ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. You see, the second thing we see here in the text is that apathy is cultivated when you and I forget our need. It's cultivated when we forget our purpose and it's cultivated when we forget our need. If you remember, Laodicea was an extremely wealthy city, right? They were independent. They were self-sufficient. They were extremely successful, right? This is the place everyone wanted to be. Does that sound familiar to a place like we live in, right? The problem is this, that mentality of independence and self-sufficiency and, and success began making its way into the church. And this is where things get really hard. Verse 17, he says, um, you say, I'm rich, I have become wealthy, and I need nothing. You can circle that word need. I don't need anything. Here's the danger in this. The danger is that there's this false sense of security in our stuff, in our accomplishments, and in our wealth, and in our jobs, and in our 401ks, and in how good or bad we're doing as parents, or how good or bad we're doing in our marriage. There is a false sense of security in that. In this church, what they had done is they had forgotten their need. Jesus steps in and he reminds them, he says, look, you don't realize that you're actually wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked, Right? You think you have your whole life together? Guess what? Jesus says, you're not as great as you think you are. Hard to swallow, but it's true. But this city, this church, they thought they had everything figured out, but the reality was they were placing value on things that actually had no eternal value whatsoever. And so Jesus, verse 18, he advises them. I love that. He advises them to buy from him gold refined by the fire, white clothes, and eye salve. Once again, I told you the, the, the historical context, right? Jesus is using their merchant language. He's using the things that they care about most, the things they pride themselves on most, and, and the things that they're pursuing. And he uses their language to encourage them. And he says, to rebuke them and encourage them, he says, hey, pursue things that last. Like, come to me for, for gold that's refined by fire or white clothes or um, eye salve. And so here's what's interesting. If you, if you kind of are... You want to dig in just a little bit more? I'll give you just real quick for those who love this stuff. Gold refined in the fire refers to spiritual riches, right? Things that are actually going to last, things that have eternal value. Uh, white clothes re refers to white, uh, bleh, can't talk. White clothes refers to righteousness, righteous living as well as the imputed righteousness of Christ, what we receive from him. And then uh, salve refers to their need for the word of God to rest, rule, and abide in them. What he was saying is, hey, you guys are blind. You're not seeing the world the way I want you to see it. And here's the thing. If you and I are not careful, we can fall into this trap that the Laodiceans did. What I mean by that is you and I can get caught up in comfort. You and I can forget our need for Jesus and we can begin placing our confidence and our security in our stuff, our accomplishments, and our wealth. We can begin convincing ourselves that we don't need anything. We're good. We live in Bernie, Texas. 
and we can take his grace for granted or we can become complacent in our walk with Jesus or, hey, I, I know I should, I know what I should do. I know I should spend time with the Lord, but I just don't have time. I'm just too busy. I, don't, I just don't really care. Oftentimes it's not an issue of you don't have enough time. It's a matter of you don't really care. Let's just call it what it is. I don't want to. Or here's what we can do. We can pursue all kinds of things. Church, listen to this. We can pursue all kinds of things that have no eternal value whatsoever. Right? I love the, the, the phrase, you never see um, a U-Haul behind a hearse. You just don't. <laughs> like, you don't see one. Because things on this earth, there are things that just don't matter. Let's not pursue things that don't matter. And so church, we have to be reminded of the gospel on a daily basis. We have to be reminded of our need. The gospel is the thing that keeps us grounded. The reason the gospel is amazing, it, I call it, it's the great equalizer. Like you and I are more sinful than we think we are. In fact, we're far worse than we think we are. But Jesus is far greater than we can imagine. And so the gospel is what keeps us grounded. It keeps us focused on things that matter. Does that make sense? How are we feeling at 11 o'clock? You feel good? Yep. Want to keep going? <laughs> All right, here we go. Verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be zealous and repent. See, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. To the one who conquers, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Verse 22, let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. The last thing we see is, is this, that apathy is cultivated when you and I forget our relationship. So when we forget our purpose, when we forget our need, and then finally, when we forget our relationship. As I read through this, I, I have to imagine that the church in Laodicea, they probably weren't feeling very encouraged at this point in the letter, right? Like, hey, you guys, like, you're actually pitiful. <laughs> like, like you, are, you are useless, so they're probably feeling discouraged and probably thinking, man, why is he being so hard on us? But I love this. Then Jesus explains to them why he's calling them out. Look again at verse 19. It says, as many as I love, I rebuke and I discipline. Right? As many as I love. What he wants them to understand is this. Hey, the reason I'm speaking hard truth to you is because I love you. It's not about what I want from you. It's about what I want for you. In fact, I'm not against you. I'm actually for you. And I want you to live a life that matters. I want you to live a life with purpose. I want you to live a life that's going to last. And what he says is, is this. I love, I don't know about you, I love the fact that we have a God who cares enough to advise his people. Right? He doesn't just watch his people walk down a road to destruction. He cares enough to say something and say, hey, don't do that. It leads to a place of destruction. Don't do that. It leads to a place of, of worthlessness. Like, don't pursue things that don't matter. I love that God cares about his people and he cares about how they live their life. How would, how would things change for you if you stopped viewing um, God's word is something you have to do, but you viewed it as an opportunity to continue trusting in the one who's already proven himself trustworthy. Like how different would your life be? Look at verse 19. He says, so be zealous and repent. What Jesus is doing, he's saying, hey, he's calling them out of apathy. That word zealous, right? You think passion. Be passionate and repent. Over time, what the church had done is they had forgotten their passion. They had forgotten their first love. They had forgotten the one, uh, who he was and what he had called them to. And so Jesus calls them to repentance. He says, hey, look, repent. Repent. If you've been in church for a while, you know it literally means to turn in the opposite direction. So he's telling them, hey, stop running that route. Turn around and come back to what matters. Verse 20, see, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and he opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. This is another one of those verses that I think sometimes is, is ripped out of context. Don't get me wrong. Uh, you can find a similar passage in the Gospels uh, that talks about salvation. But this is not, I want to point out to you real quick, um, this verse does not refer to salvation. Um, what he's doing is he's calling them back to fellowship. He's calling them back into a relationship. And here's what we should take note of. It's possible for you and I to have to believe in Jesus, yet forsake the relationship. 
It's possible for us to say, hey, we follow Jesus, but at the same time not focus on the relationship. It's possible for you to be married and have a bad marriage. It's possible for you to be a parent and not actually have a relationship with your kids. And so what I love here is that Jesus is calling them back, looking, and he says, if anyone hears my voice, he's calling them back to relationship, back to fellowship. And so here's where things are going to become very, very practical for you and I as we start to land this plane a little bit. Here's where it becomes practical. It's important for you and I to remember that Christianity is a relationship. It's not a religion. It is a relationship. Religion is easy to walk away from. Religion is easy to become apathetic towards because religion will tell you, every other world religion will tell you, this is what you have to do. This is what you have to do. You have to do this. 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 But Christianity is the only It's the only one that that does not say, here's what you have to do. What it points to is, here's what Jesus has done for you. Like, you don't have to earn it. In fact, you don't even deserve it. What Jesus has done for you is enough. It's sufficient. Like, why did he do that? So that we could have a relationship with him, so that we could live a life in relationship with him. Not only that, when we put our trust in Jesus, the Bible says that the spirit of God indwells us. The same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that lives inside of us. So we can live differently. And his job is to, um, is to make us more like Jesus. That's what the spirit does. He testifies to Jesus and he, he convicts the world of righteousness and uh, of unrighteousness and, and judgment. Like he convicts us and makes us more like Jesus over time. And so here's, what, here's why the gospel is good news. It's not about what you do. It's about what Jesus has done. And so what do we, how do we, how do we apply this to our lives? How does this change the way we live? Once again, apathy is cultivated when we forget our purpose, we forget our need, and we forget our relationship. But when the gospel begins to take root in our lives, here's what comes forth, compassion and diligence. Those are two very interesting words. Uh, diligence means it's defined as a careful and a persistent work or effort. It's a careful and persistent work or effort. Here's the thing, when you put your trust in Jesus, what happens is your passions begin to change. What happens is your priorities begin to shift. You now have a purpose. Going and making a paycheck is no longer uh, the only thing that you care about. What you realize is there is a purpose in making a paycheck. It's not so that you go to your job and you bring home a lot of money. The purpose of going to your job is so that you rub shoulders with people who don't know the good news of the gospel and you share it with them. That's That's the goal. Right, But when you put your trust in Jesus, you begin living differently. The Spirit begins to convict you. You begin changing what you do and why you do what you do. And so diligence, the idea of living with diligence is this. It's about you and I working hard, that we're good employees, that we're good parents, that we're good spouses, that we're good neighbors, that we work hard, that we're faithful to reading God's Word, and we're faithful to pouring out our lives for the benefit of other people. That's what it means to be diligent that we work hard and we pour ourselves out because we know who the source of life comes from, right? We know the source of life. Compassion is the second thing. Compassion is a really interesting word. I'm gonna wrap this up. Compassion is an interesting, interesting word because when you break down its origin, it literally means to suffer and to bear, all right? So it's translated literally as to suffer together. It's this idea of seeing suffering and going and saying, seeing someone who's suffering and saying, hey, I'm in this with you, and it's stepping down into the mess with them. That's called compassion. That you and I are called to live this kind of life as believers. You and I are called to walk alongside people and to see them the way God sees them. Not only that, but it's to love them like crazy and to step into the mess with them and to point them to a hope that does not disappoint. Can we all agree this place is jacked up? Like, can we all agree this world is not getting better, church? It's not. But when we're called to live a life of compassion, what it means is we walk alongside people, and when they begin suffering, we step down into it with them, and we point them to a hope that does not disappoint. Like, the reason they can endure in suffering is because we have a hope that doesn't disappoint. The reason they can press on is because we have a hope that does not disappoint. Does that make sense? Yes? Here's what I think is interesting. It's impossible for us to be compassionate when we're only concerned about ourselves. If we're just like the church in Laodicea that's just focused on, on what we have. And so church, here's my prayer. My prayer is that we would not make this complicated. 
that we wouldn't be overwhelmed by all the things that we should care about. If you should care about anything, here's what you should care about. Love God, love people. Love God, love people. And when you have the opportunity and you've earned the relational right to talk to people, you share with them the story of redemption that is for them. And you tell them about who Jesus is and what he's done for them. That's the life that we're called to. So let's not make it complicated. 